everyone. Hi. Welcome to building a Ruby GraphQL API. It is awesome, easy, and fast in our experience. I'm Anna Heedley, uh, working as a developer at Princeton University Library. I'm Trey Pendragon, also at Princeton University Library. Uh, I'm going to get us started. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of the context. Oh, yes. Just to give you a little bit of uh, context for why we use GraphQL, we've got this thing in our digital repository and we have for a long time that we call a order manager. Um, the use case is really, we have a bunch of pages in a book, we need some way to do things like bulk rename, now they're all named page something or other. Uh, we need to do things like build out IIIF manifest so it stores properties such as uh, whether or not it's a start page, which means you pull it up in the viewer and that's the first page that shows up. It stores things such as this is the thumbnail so that uh, the manifest can say which resource is the thumbnail when you pull it up. And uh, a little bit of zoom so that the people who are working in this system can actually dig through and see what the specifics of each page are, even though they're looking at a large resource. When we initially started this project, um, we powered this thing off of a IIIF manifest because we're building up IIIF manifest. Uh, all of the data that we might need to pull it together should have been there. And it worked for all of the use cases we could think of at the time. Um, until we came up to the use case of bound widths. Do we know what bound widths are? All right, so bound width is like, I've got a bunch of volumes of a book, and somebody else has rebound them together. So we want to still store the front cover, and also the volume one, volume two, volume three, as individual things with their own metadata, and then the back cover that's on the back. That's clear? Unfortunately, we weren't able to model that use case in IIIF, so we needed some new way to interact with our resources. So before I get into exactly what we're doing, I want to mention that we think this is awesome, and thus you will see on every slide, well, most slides, an awesome picture. And I'll describe the pictures for you. So first things up, why we chose GraphQL? Uh, there's another team in Princeton. The other team were interested in using GraphQL. And we believe in their opinions. So we decided we'd try it out. Uh, we also knew that whatever specification we used to power that order manager was going to have to be based on some sort of spec. Uh, there are a variety of options out there. Uh, we had built some REST-based ones in the past. We knew it took a fairly significant amount of work to make them work the way we needed to, and there were a variety of options. Um, other things we liked about GraphQL, and you'll see this in a minute, there's only one endpoint. So there's only one like place we need to deal with things like security. Uh, you always know where to go. There's a standardized place that people would expect to go to. Uh, there was this really neat repo inside the browser, and anytime I can play with my API by typing stuff in, I feel like that's a good day. Uh, and it's really good documentation. So if you go on the, both for the way we implement it as well as the specification itself. Oh, sorry, the picture, we'll, we'll get to that. The picture on this slide was a volcano, which is awesome. Uh, this is Sky. that's my golden retriever, and she's also awesome. So we wanna give you a little bit of introduction to GraphQL. Uh, we're going to look at queries, types, interfaces, inline fragments, and mutations. Uh, a lot of these should kind of map to your own knowledge of the concepts in general development, but uh, others might look a little different than what you're used to. So at its simplest, GraphQL is about asking for specific fields on objects. Uh, we just pulled that quote from the GraphQL documentation, which again is fantastic. 
Uh, this is an example of a query that you can run in GraphQL. Uh, can people read it? Nope. Nobody can, can some people read it? <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm sorry, other people will try to describe it. So at the top you can see I'm asking for a resource, or you can't see, with an ID. Uh, and I'm saying, the important part is I'm saying, when you come back, I want my ID back, and I want my label back. And give me all of your members, and for every member, give me its ID and its thumbnail and this AAAF URL for it. Don't go arbitrarily deep to figure that out. And you can see it comes back with a resource. Maybe I can not block, or you can't see. It comes back with a resource, the ID, the label of it, the members, the ID, and the thumbnail, and which is exactly what I asked it for. No more, no less. Uh, there are a lot of ways to make the queries more flexible. There are things like variables, uh, control logic. Uh, you can parameterize some parts of the queries to make it easier to reuse them, and we're going to go over exactly none of that. So please read the documentation if you're super interested. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up with this is uh, it's nice, uh, especially for our order manager use case, that we can specifically say, in one query, give me back all of the members. And we don't have to implement anything super hard to make that happen. Uh, this is the Sphinx. I think it's awesome. Uh, the other, inside GraphQL, you have schemas and types. Uh, every GraphQL service defines a set of types uh, that is all the set of data you can query on the service. Uh, the simplest types are the types defined on the fields of an object. So uh, you can see right now, or you can't see. Who can see? Who can't see? Everyone. Oh, I'm sorry, Carolyn. <laughs> Um, so there is a scanned resource, that's one of our models. It implements the resource, we'll get to that. You can see it has different fields as well as the types that it will return when you ask it for it. Uh, it'll, you can ask for an ID, a label, a manifest URL, members, source metadata identifier, we're not going to go over it, uh, start page, all these kind of things. <coughs> and not only will the API document itself and tell you which fields you can ask for, it'll tell you the types that come back and these little things, uh, you can ask it for details about the kinds of data that will come back for things like resource. So it's self-documenting in a way. Uh, this is my kitten, who is no longer a kitten. It's Tiberius. Awesome. Uh, so queries are also types. Basically everything in GraphQL is a type. At the root, you can see a couple of our queries. They look like fields. The difference is they take arguments. So I can say, give me a resource by an ID, give me resources by a bib ID. As, and it'll tell you what kind of thing it'll return. Uh, if it's a resource, I gave it the ID, so I only get one back. I give it a bib ID, then I might have multiple things. And thus, it's an array that comes back. Uh, if you, this is similar to inheritance or interfaces that you'll see. All right, who doesn't know what an interface is in a programming language? That's amazing. Okay, so this is an interface like you would see in any programming language. It's a set of fields that uh, everything needs to implement. Uh, so if you have multiple things that are like, as for us we have things like scanned resources and maps and stuff like that, uh, you can say, all, every, all of these should implement these features, and that makes it a resource, and thus you can return it as the return value of any of your queries or anything like that. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, we have one thing that's useful about this is that you can do the generic return value. So this is I'm asking for resources with an ID, give me back an ID, a label, members, all the ID. Uh, but if I have a more specific version of a resource, something that just implements the interface, I can say give me back this field for that more specific resource. And it'll just do it quietly. And now I'm going to 
turn it over to Anna to describe mutations. Okay. Oh, you have your own. This is mine. You need that though. Um, I think this is the last slide that's just in our GraphQL intro here. And as it says, a mutation is just like a fairy. Its fields are the mutations you uh, created for your endpoint. So you just give it a name. In this case, it's called update resource. And um, when you're using the mutation, you tell it the fields that it needs to have to call the mutation. Here we have to give it the ID of the resource we want to change, and then the field that we want to change here is the view interaction. Um, within the mutation is sort of embedded another query. So you don't have to call back again after the mutation is done. You just say, once you've done the mutation, send me that, send me back this information. All along um, the the whole purpose of, of the API being as few calls to the API as we can, as we can have. <clears throat> so here is the easy part. This is um, one of the best things about using GraphQL, and in particular this library, which provides this in browser REPL, which is called Graphical. Um, this little video will show you just what it's like using that REPL in your browser. It provides some autocomplete functionality here. Since it knows, since you've defined your schema, it knows what fields you could put in at any time. Um, here we're sending a query. We're getting the resource. We're getting the members. Here's that fragment, that inline fragment. Um, that we're only going to get back on a scanned resource. And then we're going to do a mutation. And all along the way, as you enter things in, you just push that little go button, and the right side of the screen will show you the results. Um, right here, you finish this up. And then all the way at the right side, there's some docs that you can navigate through. As you can see, these, this is where we got all the screenshots for the previous slides, um, showing what the, what the schema looks like. And now I'm just going to talk about our experience developing this endpoint. Um, and it was, it was really fast. We thought about switching to pictures of things that are fast, but the awesome things were too appealing, so we're just sticking with pictures of things that are awesome, like space. Um, this slide just shows you the URL for the repository of the library that we used to implement this endpoint in Figgy. Um, some pretty familiar installation instructions for you developers. This is an awesome ghost ship. And here is the code you get when you run the generator on this library. Um, you get some code generated into your routes to create the path for you there. You get a uh, controller is generated. And it sets up this execute method, which is how you call out to your queries and your mutations. There's a little bit of, um, you know, hash manipulation, and you can have this context <coughs> object, which allows you to pass sort of arbitrary data down to your queries and mutations that you might need. Um, we'll see that again later. And then it just calls execute on your schema and sends the result back. This is all just the generated code before we started building stuff in. And, the, and then the following slides are going to show just some of the stuff that we slotted in to get the endpoint that you saw earlier. Here is the generated schema. It's very simple. It just says, this is my mutation, and this is my query. And these are the generated query and mutation types. Um, 
it looks exactly like any other kind of type. The name of your query you put in this field definition, and then the behavior of your query you put down here in the method. Same thing for the mutation. This is my dog, Zelda. She is awesome. This is our first query that we wrote, and it was, we started pretty specific. It was a, it was a query for a scanned resource. Um, it took an ID argument, and you can see the field definition, and then the method which tells GraphQL how to populate that field. There's the argument, the ID argument, and there's some, a little bit of code below here that's just like Valkyrie-ish stuff that's not super relevant. Our first type, oh, one thing that's awesome is helping people. So there's a helper. You can guess who that helper was. Um, the first, the first type that we wrote, although, as you know, a query is just a type, but so maybe this was our second type. This is the scanned resource, the scanned resource type. Um, it has a couple of fields. By default, this library will just call a field, like here, um, it would just take your object and call object.title to send back that field. If for some reason, your application doesn't quite work that way. That's when you provide the little method. So here we have the viewing hint method that tells the library how to get the data we need to send back for the viewing hint field. That's just a convention that's wired up for us. Being in the woods is awesome. And here's the interface that we wrote once we felt pretty comfortable with the scanned resource type. We knew we wanted to send back a lot of different kinds of resources, so we wrote this interface. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We added this class in. It defines the fields that any implementer has to have. There are a couple of weird things here. There's this orphan types method. This is just a quirk of the library because it, um, it assembles your schema based on the fields you've defined. And since the scanned resource type, since we're replacing it with this interface as a return value, there's no field that says I return a scanned resource anymore. So in order for the library to um, piece our schema together, we have to declare this orphan types. And then the definition methods at the bottom there is, is sort of like active support concern class methods. And there's more about that in the documentation. One thing that is awesome is tree houses. This is an awesome tree house. The last part of using an interface was just to take out the field definitions in our scan resource type and replace them with the statement that we're implementing that interface. So after that, we wanted to add in some authentication to make sure that the resources um, that a user of the endpoint are trying to re retrieve are resources they're allowed to view. Um, we plugged this logic into the controller, and then through the context, we could pass what we needed down to the query type. So in the controller, line five, we have the authorize right there, just that you can read GraphQL. And then down in the context, we pass the ability so that in the query, we can get that ability, and we can make sure that whoever's trying to access this endpoint has permission to read this specific resource. Here is a fractal, and fractals are awesome. Um, we added a mutation because for our order manager, we need to save the changes that we're making to um, the, the object, to the, you know, the ordered array or, or the labels or what have you. 
And mostly this just felt like writing the sort of figgy code we write all the time. Um, it was, in our case, just a matter of using Valkyrie change sets. Um, this might be harder if, like in a more traditional Rails application, there's a lot of logic in the controllers. In Hyrax, you might use the actor stack here, but it's exactly the same sort of thing we've seen going through. The um, mutation provides the fields and um, calls resolve. It does the mutations and it sends back the, the resource or the errors as a case may be. Trey is going to talk a little bit about testing. All right, so uh, it's important to test these things. Uh, the GraphQL Ruby library gives you some good advice on how to test things. Please go read it. We'll give you the Cliff Notes here, the Trace Notes. Uh, we, another gem we used was RSpec GraphQL Matchers for unit testing. It's a gem that somebody put together. Uh, you can see, quite um, some of these, some of our tests just do simple unit tests on the types. You might see things like make sure you have a field, make sure it returns a string. This is just to make sure, these are just to make sure that we don't break our expected schema as we work on it. And then you can instantiate that uh, object and just run regular unit tests like you would on any other object. I'm not going to show them because many of us have written tests before. Uh, this is going to be hard to read, but uh, we found that it was important to also write integration tests. This whole library is really built on convention. So there are, there's a controller that's built for you that you hardly change, and then a bunch of types that it knows how to navigate and return values for. So it's pretty easy to accidentally not have it fit together right. So it's nice to make sure that you can actually run a real query through it. So here you can see the speaky scheme object that the controller runs. I set some stuff up, and I can just run a real query. This is sort of what a GraphQL query looks like. And make sure that, the, that it actually returns the real value. Uh, you can see documentation on how to do this in the Ruby GraphQL library. Uh, one gotcha that you're going to find in your tests is that you put your name in as field viewing underscore hint, and all of your tests are going to say field viewing capital H hint. Turns everything to camel case. This is how it's how you're gonna have to run GraphQL queries too. It's real friendly of them and caught us up multiple times. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Anna. So once we had everything up and running, just a couple final things we had to do was finish out all the rest of the types for the resources that we wanted to be able to return and modify, um, and then actually implement the front end that uses this endpoint. Um, we didn't do that work. Um, we're not going to talk about it here. It was done by another developer, um, but it was done in Vue.js, and there's a client-side GraphQL library called Apollo that he used. That happen. This is an awesome thing. Uh, Mario speedruns. Um, once we had everything up and running, we had a new use case come along. Um, I feel like Sandy Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> our, our catalog needs to find thumbnails based on the div ID. Um, so discussing this new use case in a meeting we had a realization, oh, we have this GraphQL endpoint, and it almost does this exactly what we need. We just need to stick in another query. So here's the, the merged PR for that query, that, that new code. It was 58 lines of, of new code, and, and then it was up and running. Um, we did have to think about security implications a little bit here because to open the endpoint to our catalog, we just had to open it up. Um, our previous use case was just internal to our own application. 
so far, this isn't something that concerns us. We don't have any queries that would really um, overwhelm our, our system or our boxes. So it's, it seems fine, but it's something we're going to keep an eye on. And final thoughts. Um, you know, we were able to get up and running enough with this endpoint so that the, the front end dev could start working on the new implementation. And it only took us like three days to get far enough for him to start messing around with it. Um, so we were really happy with this library. Um, the front end dev could basically just rely on the GraphQL documentation that exists for the schema. There didn't have to be a lot of conversations about um, how to use what we had written since we wrote it directly to that schema. Um, as we experienced, it was easy to expand the API. We still love the graphical REPL. <coughs> our use case works now, the bound widths. We're able to finally show in our order manager and modify there. And it feels good to be using IIIF for what it was designed to be used for, instead of trying to force it into using it sort of more as a CRUD API, which it didn't really feel right. That is all. Thank you. I think we have four minutes for questions. What? Don't, don't tell us we have 34 minutes. Because <laughs> this is all you're going to get. You have four minutes. No, we, had, we made them fix it. <laughs> this is something that's come up. Wow. Questions? Thank you. You got it all figured out? It's awesome. I, I didn't quite get the, the difference between GraphQL and Graphical. Yeah, so GraphQL is the, the API specification, and Graphical is just that little tool in the browser that you can try it out with. So you can type in your queries, and it'll show you exactly what that endpoint is going to return. Did you guys notice any performance issues? Or like any? For the stream, the question was, did we notice any performance issues? No. <laughs> Vicky's very fast. Uh, we had, we had uh, one case where the specific query that was running needed some performance stuff, but it was a performance issue in the application itself. It had nothing to do with GraphQL. Uh, when we've benchmarked it, it's about, like the GraphQL library is roughly 20% of the response. Has anyone done GraphQL? question was, can we use PIDs as IDs to pull out the image? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. What do you mean by PIDs? Here, why don't I bring this to you? Oh, yes. no. it's so we also have VoIP, right? Oh. Um. Okay, so the question is, like, we have noids. Can we do that instead of an ID? And yeah, these queries are arbitrary. Am I going way too far? Yeah. So these queries are arbitrary. That argument that you pick is just passed as an argument to this method. Okay. There's no reason that can't be NOID as long as you have some way to query by NOID in your system. Okay. Is that everything? Great. Thank you. Thanks.